Welcome everyone to today's DMCNY Midweek Recharge. We are going to be talking about identity resolution, which is an increasingly hot topic, very important discussion. We've got a great panel for you today, but first I wanna thank our DMCNY annual sponsors whose generosity and their support makes events like this possible. So thank you so much to our platinum sponsor, Axiom, our gold sponsors, Wyland and Alliant, our silver sponsor, Sarista, and our bronze sponsors, Jeff Olson, Epsilon, and McVigor and Higginbotham. Sorry about that. Uh, also, um, speaking of events, I do want to mention that we have two other events coming up that you definitely don't want to miss. One, we're going to get together in person um, for cocktails at the Novotel um, on October 14. And what's really cool about that is besides networking, we are going to be talking about the entitled customer. And uh, you know, uh, the, the author of that book will be there to discuss it and talk about how marketers can um, deal with today's entitled customer. And, uh, and then of course, our annual Silver Apples uh, awards gala where we celebrate the best of the the best of the industry so i hope to see you at those events uh, for today's webinar everyone uh, because we are on the webinar platform will be muted throughout the event if you do have a question for any of our speakers we will of course have q a at the end so please just use that q a box to submit your questions any technical difficulties please just chat us and we'll take care of that as quickly as possible uh, I want to thanks again for joining us and hand over to our moderator for today, Chloe Davis of Winterberry Group. Chloe, over to you. Thanks so much, Ginger, and, and welcome again to everyone uh, to this week's Midweek Recharge. Um, I'm Chloe Davis. I'm a Senior Engagement Manager with Winterberry Group. Uh, and in case you don't know who we are, we're a specialized management consultancy with an industry focus in advertising, marketing, and commerce. We work with brands, publishers, um, and providers of marketing services, technology, and data, and we also publish proprietary research. Um, identity resolution is an incredibly important topic to us because it's incredibly important to the clients that we work with in the industry. Uh, and it's a topic that we've been covering in our research since 2018. So in our identity update last year, we had three predictions for the future of identity. First, that no one solution will rule them all. Marketers will apply a blend of approaches and multiple identity solutions will be required and will continue to evolve in parallel. Two, there will be significant investments in evolving to a first party world across data, people, and technology. And third, while machine learning decisioning solutions will provide the brains for the next generation of advertising and marketing solutions, identity will remain at its heart. And so today I'm very excited to have the privilege of speaking with, with five wonderful experts in identity resolution to tell us what's happening right now in their world and also look to the future of, of where identity resolution is going and what it's going to mean in an evolving landscape for targeting, measurement, and attribution. And as solution providers, how they're responding to the changing market and, and to the needs of their clients. So, Without further ado, I'd like to do a round of introductions from our panel of experts today. Um, and we'll go in the order on the screen here. So starting with AJ. Hey, everybody. Nice to uh, meet everybody virtually. And uh, I am uh, Ajay Gupta. I'm the CEO of Starista. We are a identity marketing and activation company. What that generally means is we focus on uh, putting together a identity graph that uh, updates in real time, specifically focused around uh, CTV identity, uh, among other things. And um, on top of that, we layer in campaigns uh, largely around uh, our DSP and ESP. So those are so the online uh, tools that we utilize. And in recent uh, year, uh, we have done some acquisitions related to being able to do uh, geofencing and attribution on uh, physical store visits as well. 
Hi everyone, I'm Katie Koval. Uh, I'm with Nielsen and I lead from a product development standpoint, our attribution, multi-touch attribution and our campaign and market lift products. So obviously from a Nielsen perspective, we run the gambit of end-to-end -end solutions around audience measurement, around performance um, and outcomes measurement and content. And so from an identity perspective, we have really built our own identity graph and enriched it with other third-party data sets that help um, provide the foundation for our resilient solutions um, and measurement products that we'll offer to our clients now and in the future. I'll go next. Hello, my name is Zora Sinnott. I am SVP of Marketing and Strategic Partnerships at Infutor Data Solutions. Um, our mission is to connect companies with customers uh, by delivering real-time identities, attributes, actionable intelligence from our identity graph, which contains online and offline identifiers as the primary component of our profiles, plus all of the attribute and um, uh, transactional signals that you would use to make uh, marketing decisions. Uh, we are primarily focused on identity, identity verification, uh, completion, uh, enrichment, um, but we've also uh, kind of tiptoed toward providing advanced analytics, custom modeling, and predictive insights in the more recent uh, months. Uh, I'm Al Gabbitt. I'm the CTO over at uh, Claritas. Uh, my primary responsibilities fall in the areas of graph, uh, email, and privacy. I came to Claritas three years ago as a merger with a company that I founded uh, almost 20 years ago called AcquireWeb. Uh, at AcquireWeb, I think we built our first identity graph uh, nine years ago uh, and have watched the industry begin to really evolve as, uh, as people have embraced that. At Claritas, the purpose of, of what we're trying to pull together is, is, is a well-known uh, uh, consumer segmentation, uh, tying that to identity, making that that uh, consumer insight available through multiple different channels in the digital world, and tying that to um, activation as well as through measurement. And I'm Sarah Stevens with Epsilon. Um, I'm a VP of uh, digital capabilities here and have responsibility for our identity resolution offering core ID. Um, that ID obviously can traverse uh, both channels, uh, can live in an ID based or digital space or a offline uh, PII based solution to help uh, marketers connect to consumers across uh, their channel of choice. Um, and of course, uh, we leverage a lot of the a uh, vast amount of Epsilon data assets in, uh, in building uh, our core ID. Thanks so much everyone for those introductions. Um, and to start out, I wanna ask a question that'll give us an opportunity both to level set on what identity is and also potentially an opportunity to see um, some of the diversity in the answers and thinking here around um, what drives identity and what an individual is. So we're gonna do a lightning round. Uh, we'll go 60 seconds each person. I'll just go around my screen here and call out your name and give you an opportunity to answer. And the question for this lightning round is, what is identity resolution? And how do you define an individual? So starting with Al. Uh, so I, you know, in today's marketplace, we did a, a, a sort of a, um, a survey internally and, and we were able to identify 26 different signals that the uh, brand has exposure to or is hitting them uh, on, a, on a daily, weekly basis. Um, and so with these, with these signals that are hitting the brand, it's the, the ability to resolve those various signals into an individual consumer or possibly a group of consumers and making that information actionable uh, so that the brand can take advantage of that consumer intent while they're in market. And oftentimes that's making a translation from a digital signal uh, into a, a understanding whether that's CRM or, or uh, acquisition, um, and then being able to also translate that back out into a digital world or, or a non-digital world. Fantastic, AJ, you're up next. Um, I think in terms of the uh, uh, 
a number of devices that have uh, expanded uh, and we are looking uh, in, in a world where we're, we're living with a number of connected devices. So we are uh, continually trying to find new ways to monitor as well as track uh, attribution and measurement. Thank you, Katie. Um, I, I probably have some similar things to what Al and AJ said, but definitely it's taking all of the identity resolution to Nielsen is taking all of the disparate millions and billions of signals that are out there and being able to harness those and, and recognize and link them to individuals. Uh, maybe the other thing I'd say is that uh, for, I think identity resolution goes beyond just the data that you capture, but it's the technology that you employ. Um, these, these signals and these profiles are ever changing. And um, if we think about just the past, you know, crazy couple of years that we've had, you know, how much our preferences or maybe what's important to us has changed. And that means that our profiles have changed. And so the technology that needs to be employed to be able to keep up with um, the ever-changing world, I think is just as important in identity management. Yeah, absolutely, that's right on. Uh, Zora. Sure, uh, I took a kind of a tactical approach and I'll take the second part of the question first. Um, so an individual uh, is a person and a person belongs to a household and a, house, and a person owns things, devices, uh, cars, property, and all of those things kind of reside within your, in your household. Um, so we, we define identity into kind of two categories from there. We have the personally identifiable identity and we have the non-PII. Um, PII is any piece or combination of information that can be used to single out a person. Um, so that's a name, address, combination, phone number, email to be more specific, social security number uh, in our case. Uh, things like cookies, maids, these are non-PII identifiers from our point of view. Um, they're used for targeting. Uh, and given people own devices that support these identifiers, you can use these mechanisms with some degree of certainty to market to or assess the composition of an individual um, with some degree of certainty. So uh, when you join all of the above together, uh, that's my our definition of identity re resolution, uh, taking offline and online identifiers and creating associations to understand a consumer's interactions with your brand uh, or your platform. Great, thank you. And, and Sarah, you are our last answer here. All right, uh, to me, identity resolution is knowing who a person is. Uh, so you have to identify them. Um, then knowing more about them. So creating a profile, those are all the attributes that enrich your understanding of an individual and being able to reach them. Uh, my view and, and our view at Epsilon is that uh, our recipe is uh, individual rooted in a name and address. So not an identifier, a true uh, identity of a person and that it's built on deterministic data. Uh, why? Because while we all care about reaching uh, consumers on behalf of marketers, uh, reaching is the first part. Uh, we need to be able to close the loop as, as this session is gonna talk about today with measurement. Great, yeah, and a lot of themes have already come up that we're gonna be covering um, in the rest of the, the discussion here. Attribution, the number of devices, uh, the number of pieces of information that need to be connected into an identity and into a consumer profile. So thanks so much to everyone um, for those first answers. Um, so we're gonna run through five questions now. For each question, I'll start with one of the panelists, and then when they've finished their answer, anybody else has an opportunity to jump in and respond um, or give their, their own answer to the question. So um, we're gonna start with Zora. Um, and so we'll ask, so we, we've seen an explosion in the number of addressable devices over the past few years. Um, the growth of addressable TV and digital video, um, as addressable media channels has further expanded the universe of touch points that marketers have where they need to recognize, engage, and target consumers. So with that in mind, what are the biggest pain points today with respect to cross-channel identity? And how are marketers and their solution providers um, helping to solve for those pain points? 
Yeah, I think uh, the biggest challenge for the marketer is acquiring and aggregating all of these identifiers and transactions under a single profile uh, in a way that's accurate, in a way that's scalable, um, actionable, but not totally cost prohibitive. <laughs> this, uh, so this affects consumer identification and linking, personalization, activation and reach and loyalty. Uh, so pretty much all of the things a marketer care, cares about are, are impacted by this challenge. Um, and the solution or really the, the path forward uh, as we and you, Chloe and Winterberry believe there's no single solution, the future is multi-source. Um, it's all about managing variability, variability of channels, uh, variability in a, in a brand's consumer segments, uh, a brand's relationship with each of its customers in those segments. And then not to mention the, the velocity of change in the technology and more important, the velocity of change in the consumer herself. So during COVID, 73% of US consumers uh, shopped in new ways, this is McKinsey study. A couple that with what we observed, uh, which is 37% of CRM records uh, experienced some sort of identity update over the last 12 months. So you've got the change in the consumer behavior and then you've got the change in the consumer and the consumer identity itself. So if you go query any of our, our databases, my profile today looks very different than my profile from five years ago. Um, but we as data providers have the benefit of a ton of source data to corroborate and update who I am today versus then. Um, the average marketer uh, considers himself lucky to get my email address in order to link uh, the various transactions um, I, I exchange with that marketer or that brand. Um, so the solution, I think, on the brand side is to increase the likelihood of success on the inbound engagement, make it worthwhile for me to transact my data directly with, with that brand um, in the form of incentives and then uh, subsequently building loyalty. Uh, and then on the publisher, the data partner side, uh, I think it's all about increasing the probability of the match to ensure in the case of the publisher that the audience is addressable. Uh, but then in, in the case of the data provider that we can create that one-to-one -one connection uh, at as high a rate as possible without sacrificing accuracy, but also while kind of navigating uh, the channel and privacy constraints around the, the various identifiers we're interacting with. Anyone wanna add to that? That was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> It's good though. Um, yeah, I, I, it seems to me that the, the 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 pain I think going forward is going to be as as we continue to see pressure in in uh, deprecation of various signals that are trackable. How to create that that linkage uh, with with high efficacy? Um, I, I, you know, and and we're, we're you know it's funny as you watch the marketplace. We've moved for, through this period of of you know. Uh, real excitement about what graph and identity can do, but quite frankly, if we went back and looked at it, very, very low accuracy uh, to a point now where the marketer is demanding more accuracy and, and there's more tools being brought forward. Um, but as those, as those various um, uh, nodes or, or uh, linkage points start deprecating further, we're going to go back up to less granularity uh, unless we get a, a greater push and a greater adoption from the brands to start tracking things uh, both offline as well as online from a first party perspective. I, I can jump in here. I totally agree with Zara and Al, and I'll maybe even just level it up one a level to say that right now we just live, you know, and I think we can say this at any point in time, but we live in an era of uncertainty right now around, um, as, as Zora and Al were mentioning, just the data that we are going to have access to the privacy regulations, you know, that come down from regulatory um, institutions, from technology partners, and it's it's impacting our ability to really know what data we will have access to, how we will comply or not be able to comply with those regulations, and what that means for marketers in terms of what information can be shared and, and is comfortable being shared. So I think um, as you think about it, where we sort of sit right now, and are we still in September? Yes, we're still in September of 2021. I think everyone took a little bit of a collective sigh of relief when Google made their formal announcement that they were 
pausing um, the Chrome cookie deprecation till mid to late 2023. But this is where I think we'd all agree that this is a time to act, um, that we, we don't wanna be in the same place now that, or next year that we are now in terms of that and that marketers really need to be um, figuring out and working with identity partners, um, either through ad tech or through measurement or through other means to really understand you know, the data ingestion, the data signals that we have, be able to do testing to understand the comparability or the granularity and accuracy like, like Al mentioned, so that when we get to that inflection point where we really are sitting in an area where um, third party uh, information will no longer be the norm that will be, uh, we won't see as much disruption as I think, you know, some might be concerned that will happen um, at that time. Yeah, one, one thing in my opinion that's not new is that many of the devices that or, or touch points or avenues to reach an individual have always been a bit transient. That, that is not new news. Uh, we have dealt with uh, decay. And so there has to be some level of fluidity in the solutions that have been built even up to this point to attach those, to have an anchor. Um, I think there's higher risk in solutions that are you know device only based or obviously cookie only based because uh, uh, if you're cookie only based or third party cookie based, you know, you're not operating in the Apple environment uh, today at all. But I think is the, the, the channels, you know, a connected TV uh, versus uh, a maid or an IDFA, you know, there are headwinds in the ability to um, identify that. But the, the good thing is, is that the consumers really are demanding the privacy. I think everybody on this panel wants to wants to respect that. And I think the challenge will be, okay, um, many companies want to comply. To Katie's point, uh, there's government regulations that require compliance. And I think there's going to be uh, the same here on the browser side. Uh, Apple made it clear that workarounds aren't effective. And I think that uh, that's a good thing. Uh, working workarounds aren't going to help. Uh, there's just a risk that a solution won't work in the future. So I think you know really ensuring that there's this, some level of stability and anchor um, going forward will help the marketers traverse uh, channels and so forth. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges has been that it's the large companies like the Facebooks and Apples that are able to control the uh, universal ID. And I know there's uh, all of us are attempting to create uh, an alternative to having cookies. But I think the biggest challenge we all face as uh, data companies and identity providers is that a uh, handful of uh, companies control the uh, uh, entire ecosystem of uh, where some of the most accurate identity information will come from. And they're doing their best uh, somewhat using privacy as a stick to uh, keep it uh, for themselves. So I think what happens in the next few years in terms of how the cookies play out and uh, what other forms of identity such as IP addresses and device IDs are allowed to be used um, will determine the future course of identity resolution. Any other responses to this first question? All right, great. So um, Katie mentioned the, the decision that Google made to delay what they were planning to do with cookie deprecation um, in, in originally 2022, I believe. So this time last year, uh, the advertising and, and media industries were anticipating that deprecation of third party cookies by Google and by other browser developers to be a driving force in changes to targeting and measurement solutions. Um, but in June, Google announced that, that it would delay that phase out of cookie support until the second half of 2023. Um, so Sarah, this question is for you first. How are marketers and other industry practitioners reacting to that news? Um, has the, the cookie list ship 
sailed, as it were, uh, and, and what will be the impact of that delay on identity resolution partners, on marketers, and on their agencies? Um, well, we, we did a little of our own research, and I would say that certainly, you know, Google holding a larger browser share sent probably greater ripple effects through, through the industry, right? The ecosystem has been relying on uh, this piece of technology for a long time. It was easy to use. So um, I think over two thirds had said, uh, you know, this is going to be bigger than GDPR and CCPA and over two thirds obviously were, were concerned. Um, I think in terms of marketer, marketer reaction um, and then tech company reaction, I'll, I'll go in order. Mar marketer reaction was, okay, I better start leveraging my first party data and I'm going to connect that to an identity that's going to hold true uh, and, and be sustainable as deprecation looms. Well, they've also asked for proof. So providers that are out there that had a solution when Apple deprecated in 2017 should be able to provide proof um, because if you had a solution ready, uh, that's going to give marketers confidence that if, if you were uh, in shape with Apple, who tends to be a little more heavy handed, that uh, you were in a good position for the future state. The second piece is, yeah, you can leverage your first party data and connect it to an ID, but then what happens? The ID is the intermediary out with the publishers. And to me, 2021 and even 2020, uh, in my opinion, could be deemed as the great race to the publishers. Because the good thing is, is that this has restored the publisher relationship with the consumer, but that ID needs to be connecting. That's where all of the marketers consumers are out in the ecosystem. They're on the publisher sites. So is the ID uh, integrated and operable so that A, the publishers can monetize, B, what the advertisers and marketers want is, I wanna continue to deliver personalized ads. So that to me is, you know, marketer leveraging data, understanding its importance and, and owning that, but also, you know, really um, on the publisher side, it is that that is going to be critical uh, and not just for the targeting aspects, but for also uh, measurement. So lots of work there um, across both sides. Uh, you have to have technology, you have to invest resources. Marketers have a thousand other things to do uh, a day besides read Apple's 14.7 update. Uh, so they're really relying on partners to um, educate them, advise them, or uh, prove it. Um, because this is a critical evaluation time of uh, what will I do next um, as uh, this comes. And everybody better be started now. Um, some may have, have had a sigh of relief, but um, I don't think there should be resting uh, involved. Uh, you never know, Google could pull it early. Your point, Sarah, um, we work with a, I sit on the marketing side as well as the partnership side. We work with a pretty large uh, retargeting platform and uh, being an identity company, of course, I'm like, well, what are you guys gonna do? <laughs> and our account manager, you know, just kind of gets very quiet, um, uh, a little deer in the headlights. It's like, let me talk to some people internally and then I'll get back to you. About two weeks later, I get an email, uh, which is basically a form letter from their CTO, kind of explaining what the roadmap looks like for dealing with this cookie issue. Um, and after reading through it, you know, pretty much there's 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 no kind of clear solution in sight. Um, yeah, I mean, so the the level of investment uh, and the level of time required to not only understand the issue, but also kind of disseminate information, not just about the kind of macro effects, but also the micro effects within the, the organization with the technology within the platform. I mean, it's an astronomical undertaking. It's, it's huge. Um, so I think, you know, the delay was definitely something that kind of made me breathe a bit of a sigh of relief. Um, I, I having, having renewed my contract with that vendor. Um, 
I think our, you know, our clients who are working with us and asking us the same questions, we're a little bit closer to the source. We're also not a cookie based graph. So we're, we're positioned a little bit differently in this. Um, you know, the ones who are evaluating identity solutions uh, in 2020 are either currently using those solutions or using a competitor solutions um, today. So uh, yeah, I think we, we really kind of on our part, on Infutor's part, we leveraged this announcement to kind of double down on building our own understanding of which universal IDs do we want to integrate with and how do we want to position our own. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the general consensus. I hoped that it would at least give us, you know, maybe six months of not having to talk about third-party cookies, but I was wrong. You you raised <laughs> you raised one of the the key things we get asked about. What yeah. happens to my site interactor campaigns? What mm -hmm. happens in cross-device remarketing? You know that that really is the 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 third-party cookie was uh, quote easy authentication. Mm -hmm. And that is where uh, first party. First party is not just first party data in my CRM file. First party is uh, a first party cookie that allows um, that capture or XREF to an identity solution. I mean, that's very valuable to marketers, what people are doing on their sites. Yes, there's web analytics, but it's not just what they're doing. It's uh, formulating that into appropriate attributes for uh, targeting in the ecosystem. And that's that whole part of, hey, uh, a cookie, third-party cookie traveled. Now you need an actual ID to travel and move around. And, and so that to me is the big, you know, replacement, find, find and replace um, an, an ID that can, that can go. Yeah. I mean, what we're seeing now, um, you know, eight years ago, it was really all about third-party cookie. Uh, we deprecated that probably four or five years ago. It still is something that we look at, but it's it's funny what um, what's old is what's new, right? <laughs> is you know it, it, I think it was ten years ago people were writing about the death of email, and now as it re results as a as a linkage point, uh, email becomes the new king. Um, it's going to be, you know, one of the big drivers for ID 2.0, and and being able to tie that back with your first party data as your as your go forward linkage point or uh, a, a, essentially a proxy ID into uh, into digital linkage is um, is going to be key for at least the short term. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where this all goes vis a vis uh, third party cookies and even the pressure that first party cookies probably is going going to deal with over the next couple of years. I think if we look at the uh, live ramp stocks over the last year, it gives a good indication of what marketers are thinking about third party cookies. Um, but I think uh, to everybody's point, we're all working towards a world of uh, cookie-less solutions. And there's definitely going to be uh, other identity points, whether it's hashed emails or uh, IP addresses that uh, we can work around. And obviously um, every few months there's new announcements saying Apple is no longer going to allow emails as, as a, a point of reference. So I think it's a ever changing landscape. And so all of us have to um, stay equally abreast of all the changes as well as uh, have the ability and flexibility in the graphs to be able to move to something else as needed. I want to give anyone else a chance to respond before I move on to the next question. I think there was a, pan, a question that came in um, uh, regarding, you know, tokens or maybe what I'm going to interpret as identifiers. So those, you know, a phone number, you know, a household phone, landline, or a mobile number, or multiple emails, or all those signals to me are are match keys. You know, we can. You can match uh, because not all clients are created equal. You know, we we want to live in a dream world that uh, uh, CRM records are fully complete, collapsed, and uh, great. But you know, what if you're an app and you really are um, based in email, or 
You have a rewards program, many loyalty programs, anchor and phone number and are lucky to get emails. That's the depth of an identity. If, if you've got an identity solution, it better have depth because uh, your provider should be doing the heavy lifting and completing all that and you get to come in and benefit from it. So I only have mobile numbers, great. Uh, we can match to that. Um, and that, that really uh, gives utility uh, to a broad set of clients. Um, I think the only uh, piece that really is gonna be critical of all of those quote identifiers, you know, outside of a name and address is that the publisher anchor is really gonna be based on email. And so to Al's point, that publisher relationship and integration and authentication, uh, well, email is gonna be a big key um, and probably one of the most important out um, in the ecosystem. But certainly um, I think, you know, from, from our view is we're looking at um, any type of identifier so that we can uh, accommodate different clients. Great, so Sarah, you mentioned earlier that from the marketer point of view, um, you know, they consider that it's it's time to really start leveraging first party data um, and, and connect that to identity. Um, and in, in 2020, last year, Winterberry Group conducted a survey of brand marketers and their agency partners. And we asked respondents how they expected the loss of third party audience cookies to impact their use of data. 60% of those said that they would increase spending or emphasis on the use of first party data. So Katie, starting with you, how does that track with where you see marketer focus and investment going in 2021? And how are brands leveraging that first party data to connect with and engage consumers? Yeah, thank you. So I actually think I think if you redid that survey, if Winterberry um, and your organization redid that survey, I bet the number might even be higher. Uh, this year than it was in 2020. And that gap there is, is probably companies that just don't have access or, or readily have access to first party data that they can collect because it certainly is going to become the you know, connective tissue um, in terms of how it is that we track, like Sarah mentioned, you know, if the hashed email is going to become that identifier um, through the publishers and linking that with the advertisers, you know, from my perspective, again, sitting in a world where we provide measurement understanding, um, we have to be able to understand that full funnel journey and first party data is going to be critical to that. If you think about it, in the world that we sit in with all of the privacy regulations with opt in and opt out frameworks right now, obviously data access is becoming more restrictive. And we're putting a lot more of the control into the consumer's hands about what data they are or are not comfortable sharing um, outwardly. But even with all of that constriction and regulations that we're seeing, we're actually moving um, towards a place of increased personalization. So while some consumers may not be um, comfortable sharing some of their information, they act, information they actually have expectations that they will get individualized, authentic, relevant and meaningful brand communications and brand experiences. And first party data is going to drive that. So when you think about from a marketer's perspective, the amount of first party data that's there for large companies, they've probably been sitting on this data, they've been collecting it for years and years and years through you know, a CRM program or customer data platform or the like. And they have the ability now, and they really need to start thinking about how they leverage it, because a lot of that data existed, but probably wasn't being fully harnessed um, to the value that it could provide. But now they have the opportunity to be able to segment that data, understand it, get it down to the individual level, but also scale it up to be able to find um, like individuals that they can message with you know, common messaging that still feels very customized and individual um, to that person. And for smaller niche brands, think of the, just the proliferation of direct-to-consumer brands that have you know, um, grown um, and exploded in the last you know, five, 10 years. They were built on first-party data. They understood a need in the marketplace, and they were able to collect that information and build a brand narrative that delivers on that experience that builds that customer 
loyalty. So absolutely believe that first party data have and will continue to be um, critical to how we engage um, and how we send brand messages, how we measure those to be able to collect media exposures with different outcomes um, or expectations and how it is that we help marketers you know, make um, better decisions around um, their investments. I would say, you know, if if uh, if revenue is any indicator, I mean, we're seeing a huge increase in in sales as a result of brands that are out there looking to add additional uh, segmentation insight, uh, essentially shoring up their their first party data. Uh, whether that's really attributable to um, the changing landscape as far as being able to get connectivity, and they know that if they don't get their arms around their data and 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 be able to create connectivity into the digital world uh, with some type of insight against their their existing customers, they're going to be lost. Uh, or whether it's just COVID, you know, and people are just taking the time to to kind of bring it back in. I I don't I can't say, but but there, we're definitely seeing an increase in um, in in brands. Uh, beginning to, to get more uh, insights around their, their first party data. And an increase in kind of marketplace offerings, um, secure data shares, like all of these technologies are, are popping up left and right. We're working with for the folks at Snowflake, we're working with AWS um, and ADX, uh, but it's, it's clear that these marketplace offerings are tied to demand and the demand is a secure join of first party data to additional insights that you wouldn't otherwise be able to collect about the consumer. Um, so that, that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah, I think first party data in general is becoming more and more critical and uh, a lot of brands are starting to recognize that it is gold. And so as more people start to utilize the data, but I think uh, the biggest challenge they face is a lot of brands, the uh, data is very siloed. They struggle with putting it all together in one place. Um, so individual marketing managers can go rogue and do their own sweepstakes, for example. So I think as more companies put all of their data sets in one unified system, uh, it makes it easier for them to then invest in the data and to keep it updated. But the biggest challenge is for them to get to that stage where they can actually uh, invest in the data. And then I think the second part of it is uh, a lot of them are either not doing enough or some of them are doing too much where uh, they're trying to re-engage audiences, but they end up creating hundreds and thousands of segments. And then the challenge becomes how many email creative or uh, display creative are you going to have that makes sense to support an audience of say a a million customers. So it's a fine balance in terms of uh, all of the uh, customization that becomes available as a result of a unified data layer, but also being able to balance that out with a reasonable amount of uh, activation efforts without overburdening your marketing team or agency. I would totally agree with, uh, with that. And in terms of, you know, the first part of of um, what you said is that a lot of times marketers don't, they're sitting on this data, but it's either siloed or they just don't have the right either technology or talent even sometimes to be able to bring those together and, and figure out how to leverage it. And I think to your point around, while we talk about personalization and customization in individuals, it, it's not scalable, right? So you have to figure out how to do that in a way that, that you can try and bring like-minded individuals or profiles together um, to try and do that, or else I think you'll you'll run yourself and your agencies ragged <laughs> um, trying to to generate. Um, you can certainly do things around dynamic creative optimization and that, but at the end of the day, you have to be smart about um, you know how many creatives you you make and and how you deliver those. Um, I think to be able to see the value of that. Great. So Zora had cited earlier, um, if I heard correctly, that 73% of consumers shopped in new ways during COVID. Um, and we've been hearing, you know, identity discussed more and more often in the context of connected commerce. 
um, and, and something that's that's spurred on, been spurred on in, in a lot of ways um, by changes to consumer behavior during COVID. Um, and sort of that that hybrid world of of e-commerce and mobile commerce and and in-person shopping. Um, so with that in mind, you know we see identity playing an increasingly critical role in the support of measurement and attribution. And connected commerce is quickly becoming a highly sought-after use case um, in that respect. So AJ, starting with you. What's next in the world of connected commerce and what role will identity play in enabling seamless shopping experiences and connecting consumers with brands um, and also approaching that that measurement and attribution on the back end? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest challenges that has been around for a long time is the ability to uh, connect people who walk into a store or a website and don't actually sign up or don't actually buy anything, whether it's uh, in person or on the website. Uh, so being able to identify those people in some ways why, while still being privacy compliant, I think that's probably the biggest challenge that faces us all. And uh, I've been impressed with uh, last year, I, I hate uh, going to car dealerships, I haven't been in a while, but um, as soon as I was at a uh, dealership, I was getting ads on Facebook and display ads almost instantly and uh, kept getting them for the next uh, 30 days, 60 day cycle. So it was uh, almost a surprising thing because I hadn't been to an auto dealership in a while, but it felt like that partic particular vertical was ahead of uh, some of the other uh, retail industries that uh, even we work with. So I think some of the use cases are more obvious than others where uh, this geofencing has been around for a while, uh, but being able to set it up in an automated manner where you are able to both provide, uh, and a lot of it is right now used as competitive conquesting rather than making the experience better. So I think that's one of the things that companies can do is leverage uh, the fact that they know you're in the dealership to actually uh, try to uh, get you to buy the car there, not so much because I am at a Toyota dealership, show me a Lexus ad uh, or, or vice versa, but more about how do I, uh, knowing that I am currently here, I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to buy something, that's a good time to show me that uh, uh, there, there's maybe a coupon offer and may not work for a large ticket item like a car, but say you're in a jewelry store uh, receiving something on the fly when you are within a certain radius. Uh, and some of it is happening. It's just not happening in an automated enough uh, manner and not being done at... Uh, scale to be able to customize that offering. Um, and so I think as things become, as we move towards a more unified ID, being able to know that somebody who was on the website also came to the store, uh, those are the kind of insights that I think right now we're lacking because a lot of the attribution companies do one or the other. So they might do the website attribution, but they're not really doing the... Uh, in-store attribution. So there's a disconnect in being able to um, know that it's the same Chloe that came uh, to both. And so I think once we get to a point where we're able to link those things together, it becomes a more unified experience. And then on the solution side, being able to actually leverage that information to do something useful and meaningful for the visitor. I guess I'll say that uh, to me, connected commerce starts with what we've been talking about all day, which is data. Um, that that anchor and root of a marketer managing their data isn't just for you know bespoke activations. It's it's connecting their data on their own side. You know, I think fundamentally, it's I want to create this experience, and COVID has certainly you know accelerated that. Of I want to buy shop, engage anytime, anywhere on, on really any device or, or be reachable. 
And that kind of data curation is what will really enable that. And that is another topic today that's it's connected to, which is identity. How are you gonna create that channel experience? How are you gonna create that cross device experience? How are, how are you gonna engage users in a consistent manner? Um, even many retailers had a disconnected start many, many, many years ago when uh, the physical stores were set up on one inventory and team system and the online store was set up on a wholly different one, almost perhaps competing under the same roof. And then they realized we got, we got to come together. It's the same person shopping in my store as, as, as that's on my website. Let's, let's get it together. And so this has been going on for a long time. This is just a new age of it. And I think it's uh, more challenging because um, the, 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 the connectivity, uh, as I mentioned, can be transient. There's headwinds on deprecation. So, but I think it all starts with that data and what it's connected to. And the responsibility certainly is on our side as, as many of us are providers that, that work with our clients, but I also think it's client side. We get a lot of questions about, you know, what's being built. I think somebody on the panel made a reference of, you know, you, it's it's decentralized data or uh, systems are siloed. You know, okay, what, many clients have gotten it all together. Now, what do I do? So I think the the burden to make it all work is is really on both sides of the equation. You know, as you as you look at um... The, you know, th this question, is, it's, it's a great question because the need is, is definitely out there. You hear it from, from all of the, the marketers that we talk to on a daily basis. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the need is, is pretty general um, and uh, you know, the, the ability to connect all the various pieces together to allow the marketer to have uh, insight as to, as to who's in market, to be able to track what their uh, who they're marketing to, to be able to measure the the return on investment, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, this is uh, it's not a new question, right? We we went through this ten years ago, and the whole uh, discussion at that point: well, the DMP is going to come in and solve our problems, the data management uh, platform, and you know, it, it it defaulted pretty quickly into cookie banks, which didn't answer the question that marketers needed. And, and more recently, the newer acronym of the CDP uh, it was supposed to come in and answer these questions. And um, CDPs are you know, kind of all over the place as well. They're not really answering the question either. So I, I think that the, the need is still there. The, 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 the solution is, is kind of fragmented and we're getting we're getting fragmented uh, results uh, that are kind of piecemeal for individual uh, marketers, but I don't think it's the the big solution that everybody talks about that um, just you know to, that I know of is just not out there. All right. So anytime we talk about uh, data and identity, we also talk about privacy. Uh, and consent management, and you know, we've, we've, we're in an evolving privacy landscape. Um, there's a lot of differentiation across regions, um, but the emphasis that that we've been hearing in the industry is there's an increasing focus, not just on privacy and consent management as compliance requirements, but really as as guiding principles for building consumer trust and engagement. Um, so, Al, starting with you. How are marketers and solution providers squaring consent management with deterministic identity approaches? And what's the right approach to managing identity in a privacy conscious marketing environment? Uh, great question. Uh, you know, right now, it seems to me that we're seeing tremendous pressure uh, on data from two different perspectives. You've got the you've got governmental or legislative uh, perspective, which is we've all dealt with with CCPA, CPRA, which is coming uh, be coming up in the next uh, year, a little bit more than a year. Um, uh, more recently, we have uh, uh, CDPA, the Virginia law. Uh, Colorado has something similar. Ohio is supposedly uh, about ready to produce something. Uh, that's very similar and may go into effect sooner than than Virginia. And and in case people don't know, 
these are laws that will uh, require opt-in for personal information. So it, it begins to move us into that equation towards the GDPR. Um, so, you know, are people prepared for these types of pressures and what it may do to the availability of the first party data that you're collecting? A lot of this still has to deal with notification and, and, and hopefully not necessarily consent, but certainly notification and, and uh, providing rights to consumers to either manage their, their identity within your platform. Um, on the other side, the, the technical side, you have the, the browser and, and OS manufacturers. I, you know, iOS 15 was, had a soft release last week. Um, for, for those of us who, who uh, have downloaded, you know that uh, this is the first time that they're really putting out a broad-based potential VPN. Uh, with a VPN, um, you know, essentially the IP address that everybody's kind of hanging on to right now as a linkage point of the digital goes away, uh, which uh, should kind of wake a lot of people up. Uh, so, you know, the, the, we, we've dealt with the deprecation of uh, the cookie. We've the deprecation of the mobile through uh, uh, iOS 14.5. Um, and, and now potentially the deprecation of, of IP address. The, the marketplace is getting a whole lot smaller with respect to the various points that you can hang on to that, that will result in creating a linkage. Um, I, you know, as I, as I look at it and, and, and I've had people ask me, you know, what, what's the driver? What should I, you know, uh, uh, Google has, uh, has pushed off to 2023, um, you know, on, on the third party cookie, I, I tend to look at the financial services space, the EDUs um, and the um, uh, uh, HIPAA related organizations where identity is much, much more uh, important. You know, I mean, for us as marketers, we, we lived through the early days of, of identity linkage into, into digital. And even though uh, deterministic uh, was, was, uh, as it became came into most of our consciousness was really more a marketing term than an actual mathematic computational term. Um, uh, when, when things really weren't deterministic and were probably 20% accurate. Uh, in, the, in the financial services space, uh, you know, 20% accurate puts you out of business. If you're, you can have two or three, you have serious problems. We're seeing those spaces now begin to embrace a completely different paradigm for identity and, and uh, providing access to, uh, to information. So um, when they get more fully grounded in their new paradigm, I, I, I don't see anything holding back the, uh, the Googles and others from, from just squashing down on all of these other uh, various nodes that we're kind of hanging on to now. So I think that that's going to be an important point. And those companies are the the companies that are building these solutions are are soft releasing them. I just saw that this quarter. So uh, probably 2023 is when you'll see um, more significant embrace. Um, so I, you know I, I think that uh, what this means is that, that that first party data is going to be really important and uh, for for brands in terms of targeting. Uh, and and as such is a brand, it's going to be really important to stay current with what the various permissions or what's allowed through the various legislation, as well as staying on the right side of permissions that are allowed for your apps that may be running through a various app store. Um, and, and at this point, it's all about notification um, and providing you know, notification of intent of what you're doing with that data, as well as providing the ability for uh, consumers to, to be able to act, whether it's opt out, ask, or ask for a report or what have you. Um, and it'd be ready that if the time comes uh, where you're gonna need to ask for permission, uh, then being able to be in a position to A, ask for that so that you don't have to deprecate all your first party data until you get up to speed again. I think that those are gonna be really important. Uh, finally, I think that that you know, as you're thinking about these things, first-party data is going to is is obviously going to be central, uh, and it's going to be central on an individual brand basis. I, I I can see an environment where all these different brands are essentially creating their own uh, unique graphs, um, 
and and then it'll be supported by third party data. So it's actually good news for some of us on the on the panel here, the, the ability to provide and support our clients with uh, not only segmentation or, or customer information as we've done for years or decades, but also the ability to provide linkage to the extent that we can as, the, as that environment uh, continues to shift. So um, I'm, I, I'm still pretty optimistic for where this is going, but it's, it's, it's absolutely gonna change. And I think as a brand, it's gonna be incumbent upon all of us to, to pay attention to the changes uh, both legislatively and technologically to make sure that we stay on the right side of things and continue to do the, the, the things that we're doing. Yeah, I'll add to that uh, what Al said. Uh, I started my career in healthcare at a time when uh, 15 years ago when HIPAA was not as big a deal. So, you know, people were still uh, looking up co-workers' health history and it'd be a It'd be sort of a joke uh, if somebody had to go to the doctor. Uh, so th there are things that have changed, which is good. That that shouldn't have happened, but uh, it, it used to happen, and those things are great. But a lot of what we get today in terms of complaints uh, or, or people asking us for CCPA requests, it's usually a couple of litigators or there are some people that uh, are just out there to make trouble. Uh, versus uh, many genuine inquiries about how did you get my data. It's more about a lot of F-bombs about, you know, delete my data and this and that. So uh, that's kind of the reality, I think, that a lot of the data companies deal with. And then the new reality is uh, getting deals done is, I'd say, not more complicated, but it's just a lot more paperwork because now we have addendums. So a lot of the rules that get made are not necessarily being made to benefit the consumer as much as it is for uh, all of us to hire more privacy attorneys and draft new agreements and go through more legalese and paperwork. So I, I do think there is real changes that should be made, uh, but I think a lot of the what, what's being done at the legislative level is more superficial that uh, we can easily uh, comply with with the uh, right number of high paid attorneys to draft the agreements. <laughs> yeah, and I can maybe come at it again, just from the world that I live in, um, you know, using identity from a measurement and attribution perspective and, and how we build that graph. Um, we, I think, and someone mentioned it early on um, in our session that they said that, you know, treating individuals with respect and, and that. And so a lot of what Al and AJ had talked about too is how you get that consented um, agreement to be able to collect information. And so I think, I think marketers are still and you know mobile apps especially in um now are trying to figure out how to do that in a way that um you know maximizes that consent or provides some sort of value exchange um in, in return for that consented information you know both on the marketer side and on the publisher side too um in terms of access to you know free content or i think aj mentioned sweepstakes and things like that to try and get it um you know at nielsen we believe in the power of person level data, and that's what our attribution solutions are based upon. Um, and we will continue to um, drive forward those solutions through our identity graph, but we're certainly eyes wide open that there's gonna be data gaps um, within that. And, um, you know, because of that, we have to come up with, with alternate solutions, be it, you know, scaling factors that help to account for that, um, you know, or other means for, for um, supplementing user level data. You know, we do have a proprietary asset in our panels that are direct consented relationships that we have that can help um, serve as a truth set and um, help correct for biases in the information. But again, there's gonna be other gaps that we have and um, we're gonna have to level up, I think as, as Al talked about, like there's gonna have to be a need for aggregated information cohorts, um, whatever that may be um, in the world that we live in. And, you know, and beyond that, um, you know, unauthenticated audiences, the programmatic open web that, that we um, are currently solving for, but there's going to have to be, it's not going to be a one size fits all in terms of measurement and how we will 
approach that we're going to have to use the the best data sources that we have that still provide the most granular level and accurate level of information that we have um, to help serve our our customer base so a lot of challenges but a lot of work and, and smart thinking that's going into you know how we um, how we forge on um, in 2023 and beyond yeah and I I think for marketers, one thing to really think about is what are those opt-outs uh, and opt-ins in terms of you passing those along to a provider because you'll have your own first party file, somebody could write in, somebody could call, then there's the opt-out uh, option through uh, the digital ecosystem. And so one of the risks here in all these quote identifiers or touch points is that they're singular. And if they're not treated or collapsed, multiple devices, you know, collapse to a true individual, uh, you know, there's risk for the marketer. What, why am I, I opted out of, I opted out of, of ads here. What, well, you opted out on your PC and you're still going to get them on your iPhone and then you're going to get them on your iPad. So, you know, our view is opt out at the person level. One, one opt out equals all. You don't opt out by device. I think that's uh, a bad experience for consumers. It can lead to uh, negative uh, uh, reactions to the, to, to the actual uh, marketer or brand. And you know this is not easy. We wouldn't be having this panel if, if all of our problems could be solved, solved easily. But to me, that's a big one in consent. consent. Um, and then I think there was a, a question that came in around, uh, you know, do we think the U.S. will uh, uh, opt for some sort of federal approach like GDPR? Probably is my view. And the reason for that is <laughs> um, the Internet doesn't really have state lines um, and uh, people traverse and then you're going to get into very precise requirements of, you know, where's, where is your headquarters? And then that's the state that has the jurisdiction and you must comply. And that's, that's not efficient for anyone. I think we're seeing what, you know, uh, it creep up in the number of states that are, are trying to establish things and, you know, with, with good intention, but someone's going to have to uh, organize this or we'll all spend the rest of our resources, uh, for our lifetime uh, complying across you know, all the states. But that, that remains to be seen, but I think we'll see some movement there. You know, GDPR was, was broad governance, but allowed uh, country level interpretation. So it might happen. Um, and uh, I guess uh, to, to AJ's point, there's, there's lawyers in our companies worrying about that right now. You know, Sarah, I, I probably I'm going to date myself here, but I, I agree with you completely. This this feels very much like the the email space of 2000 2001, in that there were there were 15 different states that had different email laws that everybody was scrambling to figure out how to be compliant with, and it it really required the federal government eventually to step in, and and I think our industry was important in helping to draft the laws. Uh, that resulted in in CanSpam Act of 2003, so um, which which was terrific in creating some sanity within our, our overall space. I think that it we're we're going to see a few more states that enact laws that that are going to start creating a lot more pressure before the federal government steps in. And if I was guessing, I don't know that it will follow GDPR, but I'm guessing it'll look more like uh, CCPA or CPRA. Yeah, I agree. I, when we built or rather rebuilt our, our opt out portal for CCPA, we did so kind of assuming that this was going to be a, a federal um, uh, uh, requirement at some stage. So we just made it kind of agnostic and then boiled it down to, to the applicable states, um, which has proven to be kind of the correct strategy. And to your point, Sarah, I think the consumer consent first approach is, is really critical here. Um, and when we talk to our clients, we talk about kind of their consent management strategy and what opportunities they're kind of designing and architecting along the way to capture and confirm consent. Our recommendation was always that, you know, it makes it faster and cheaper 
and better <laughs> to, to define those things up front. Um, and then in terms of actually sharing the data, once you have that consent mechanism strategy in place, you know, you can share data in a variety of capacities. We know that it doesn't, a deterministic match does not require a plain text identity. Um, you can join your data with second and third party sources without exposing even the anonymous identifiers. So, but what is required on both sides is a good consent management strategy. Otherwise the whole thing kind of falls apart. I think the uh, federal mandate of some sort will be the right way to do it. Otherwise you get into a situation as uh, business taxes go, every state has its own requirement that you did do business in. And now, you know, with the data privacy, there's really no reason uh, why we need to figure out how to comply with Vermont's data privacy law. No offense to anybody from Vermont. But, uh, so, you know, in the absence of that, then you're going with CCPA because that's the biggest state and probably the biggest threat to all of our uh, businesses. All right, thanks so much for all those great responses. Um, we're gonna move on to a final lightning round now and then we'll open it up for audience questions. So um, anyone in the audience, get your questions in via that Q&A channel and, and we'll get to those just after this round. So uh, we'll go around the screen again. Um, actually, we'll go the opposite direction. So we'll start with Sarah this time. And um, so the question is either, I guess, answer one or both. Um, either give us a 60 second case study that demonstrates how identity resolution uh, and identity solutions have driven results um, for brands um, in your experience, or if you prefer, just give us the one thing that everyone in the audience should walk away with from this discussion today. So Sarah, starting with you. Uh, I'll give a real proof in the pudding uh, one a case study. So we've worked with Walgreens for a long time um in many capacities particularly in their loyalty program and they like many innovative businesses had to evolve um they were obviously facing headwinds from several large competitors um and so they wanted to evolve kind of from a uh, a less uh data driven and, and points rewards program to get much tighter uh, with their first party data, um, why they really wanted to drive that personalized experience with, with my Walgreens. And uh, that also has set them up for a whole host of other things that are coming that we've talked about today. But they wanted to leverage things like, you know, pharmacy uh, engagements, locations, um, other things. And so they relaunched and saw, um, I think in a, in a window that I can't remember that was measured, something close to 20 million uh, signups. And then through a more personalized engagement experience improved their net promoter score. So this is a, this is a very uh, uh, great company that has been working to curate its relationships with the co its customers and um it, it measured us and it, it they, they measured themselves so that's my case study thanks uh zora you're up next okay uh i pulled two for this round i hope that's okay um so <clears throat> the first one uh is a national manufacturer of plumbing and bath fixtures i'll say that um installed in my home currently uh, this is a brand that was on a mission, this is another personalization use case, uh, to drive efficiency in a $30 million ad budget. Um, we installed identity resolution and enrichment. We, we installed it uh, at the point of the uh, inbound interaction. So uh, in real time, this, this brand was able to verify incoming identity data, use that data and other data to score a consumer's likelihood to convert, and then uh, Subsequently, the client was also able to, to leverage um, our personas to kind of deliver us a, a, a personalized treatment um, to the inbound lead. And so the result um, in that particular use case was a 10% improvement uh, in conversion rate uh, on site and just a better on site experience overall. 
Um, the second is not so much a marketing problem per, per se, but I, I like it because it illustrates how identity can be leveraged and data can be leveraged across a business, not just by a, a marketing team. Uh, so we worked with a sports and entertainment brand to, to help them analyze their CRM and evaluate new locations for expansion. They had a ton of identity data, um, but they didn't know much about who these individuals were. It's a common problem. Uh, we took the CRM, completed profiles with, uh, with geographic detail, um, but also detail about who these individuals were. So age, gender, home value, uh, wealth score. And then the client was able to make some kind of critical uh, but cost-effective decisions, uh, which were informed site selection. Um, the result was 12 new locations op opened up in, in 12 months, um, and the client is still actively enriching and updating data today uh, and extending those insights across uh, their organization to inform other decisions, likely marketing decisions. Fantastic. Katie? Uh, I'll share another case study, um, again, from a measurement perspective where I sit. So one of our clients is Barcelo, which is based in Europe, and they're a travel and tourism client. So they own hundreds of properties um, across six continents, um, hotels and other properties. And um, as you can imagine, they were very hard hit um, by the pandemic, as the entire industry was. Um, and they, but they were actually one of our first um, attribution clients to sign on with our identity sync, which is um, a, um, allowed us to be able to collect their direct integrated and anonymized first party data. Um, and this was actually um, the August of last year. Um, one of the things that you see in the attribution space is because of using tags and pixels and um, lack of cookies available on certain um, browsers and that you have a lot of disparate information that you can't connect together or connect back to the um, KPI or the outcome. And so you get a lot of what you call unattributed. You can't link it back to the, the media touch points that preceded it. Um, when we employed the identity sync with Barcelo, it brought um, attributed conversions to nearly 100%. Um, which allowed them to find further optimization within the investments that they were making and to be able to move that investment to um, higher value um, ROI, the things that were delivering their KPIs bookings. And so we um, were able to do that by moving out of some um, ineffective tactics to more valuable ones. And it actually led to a strong increase in their overall bookings, which again, as you can imagine, in August of Last year, we were still, um, you know, neck deep in, in the pandemic and, and where travel was restricted, but they actually saw um, a lot of improvements. So they've been a really um, strong advocate for identity resolution, you know, not only with us, but just within the marketplace because of the value that they saw it um, deliver to their business. Great. Thank you, Katie. AJ? Yes, yeah, so one of the uh, things we specialize in with our ID graph is also linking the uh, B2B persona of an individual. And I'm never sure when I'm allowed to use the client name. So I'll just uh, refer to them as one of the larger telecom companies. So uh, we do a lot of things for them. This particular use case was uh, they were having trouble increasing the number of B2B signups that they were getting for their uh, B2B uh, telecom program. Uh, so what we did was we utilized our graph to be able to identify uh, where people live, business executives, what their home addresses are, and as well as what their personal emails are outside of the business email. So as a result of doing that, we saw a 30% uh, increase in uh, the number of signups so for, for the ROI. And the other thing uh, they realized was a lot of times they weren't able to do attribution correctly because uh, they may have had the business uh, address or they may have had the personal address and not being able to link the two together was uh, always a challenge for them. So by being able to show them um, uh, our campaigns, as well as some of the other campaigns they were running by being able to link in uh, the addresses and the first name, last name, we showed them they were actually, campaigns were doing better than they even thought they were, just because they didn't have a good way of uh, linking somebody's uh, personal and business email or postal addresses. 
Awesome, thank you. And Al, we'll close with you. Um, I didn't I didn't put together a a, a case study, but I, I I would say that you know the uh, there's no doubt that if you can if you can get your data aligned uh, that um, it you know through the use of graph. Uh, and additional partnerships, this this information can be very, very powerful if you're not already using it. I'd be surprised if there was anybody on this call who wasn't already using it in some way and getting some positive results. I think that the the um, the take home from this uh, is that you know the times that we live in right now are changing and they're changing fairly rapidly. Um, and and you know with the way things are moving from a from a legislative and compliance uh, standpoint, um, uh, technical standpoint, I think it's going to be really important for brands to uh, harden their infrastructure for capturing and supporting first party information, um, and and it's going to be critical to their future success. Um, I would also say that that, that uh, for the entrepreneurs out there, it also creates an opportunity if somebody had a way of pulling that all together in in something that can support what the uh, what the marketers need. Um, it's it's definitely a gap in our in our environment. Great, thanks so much for those responses. Um, so I want to open it up now in this final bit for audience questions. So we, we have one question that came in. Um, anybody else that has one, feel free to send those over. Um, but the we've got a question from Dino um, and it's a really good one. So fast forwarding three years from now to 2024, um, to anyone on the panel, what do you think will have had the biggest impact on the identity resolution industry? A cookie-less world potentially, Apple privacy changes, IP version six or something else? I would say Apple and Google, and and that's not uh, if if they continue restricting. They may not continue restricting. Um, so we're down a path, but three years is a long time, and there could be uh, eyes on that uh, from our own government. There could be. Uh, involvement there. Uh, so I think for now, year one, we'll continue preparing for deprecation. I think the pieces that are privacy focused, but allow equal competition will preserve the third phase of it is a question mark. I, I think kind of generally speaking, it's probably, um, the, the governments or the court's ability, how much are they willing to tolerate mo uh, monopolies? That's what it comes down to really, um, especially as the larger the company is, they tend to be more self-righteous in terms of how they view data uh, and their own rights and ability to use that data versus a third party using that data. So I think uh, it's not one particular thing, but I think if uh, one thing goes away, there's a good chance that, uh, for example, if cookies go away completely, there's a good chance uh, IPs will end up getting masked as well because the, the whole idea for it more than the, uh, I think, uh, you know, I don't think anybody minds that much to get a retargeting ad to get a coupon uh, from them. But uh, in order to try to take that away, you start taking away IPs and then cookies, and it makes the uh, web experience a lot less personalized and uh, essentially puts in more ad dollars in the hands of Facebook and Google. Yeah, I think the, uh, the biggest impact beyond what we've already discussed here, for better or for worse, is probably the consumer's adoption of uh, uh, consensual targeting. Um, so an email address is a, a well understood identifier, um, one that I'm willing to exchange for something for access to some content or some service. Uh, so that value exchange, I think the consumer's acceptance of that value exchange is critical and seeing the rate of adoption among consumers, it will grow um, over time of that exchange. Uh, I think that's going to be extremely impactful. Um, that's my two cents. 
And I'll just add that we mentioned it before, I think trying to navigate all the legal um, red tape of, of managing all of these requirements across organizations and government regulations is, you know, going to be, um, you know, it's, it's a slippery slope and you have to, you have to really be buttoned up in terms of making sure that you understand all of the nuances of these regulations and what they mean as either a processor or controller of data and then how that data is used. So I think from organizations, it's gonna, you know, as people said, there's there's a lot of lawyers and I expect there's going to be more um, involved in, in the decisions that we have to make. Yeah. I, I would say that if we if we look back three to six years uh, from where we were to where we are now, we're, we're still doing many of the same things we were doing uh, six years ago. There's just a lot more information that's that's available to allow, allow us to do it smarter. Um, there's also a lot more pressures than what we had uh, three years ago. I don't expect any of that is going to change. Three years from now, uh, we'll, we'll still be doing many of the same things we're doing. There's just going to be different pressures, different rules that, that drive that. Um, and it's just going to be important that we stay current uh, through these types of organizations and, uh, and make sure that we comply with where the, the new rules and as well as the new technologies take us. Um, uh, you know, there, there's definitely still going to be a need uh, to, to, to reach consumers. Consumers still want to be reached in, in meaningful ways. Um, and so I, I, I can't tell you what it's going to absolutely look like. I, can, I do believe it's going to be different than the way it is today, though. Yeah, it, no, not all is lost. This will spark innovation. Innovation is good for any industry. And, you know, we'll, we'll see how uh, things play out. I think uh, getting privacy on the mind or privacy by design is good. Uh, and companies are going to uh, focus on that. Um, and, and I agree. I mean, there are far, more, far worse offenses happening on the internet than receiving an ad. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, people uh, will appreciate uh, something being more personalized uh, uh, if uh, they understand that trade. And that's what you're seeing the apps do right now it, uh, with, with uh, the, the uh, tracking consent. Um, they're being explicit. I've seen some great messages. Hey, you know, you're getting our news content for free. This is a trade. And, and so I think that uh, the conversation is changing between and becoming maybe more transparent between marketers and consumers. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's a fantastic place to wrap this up. So thanks so much to all the panelists. Um, I'll turn this back over to Ginger. Who is a little slow with the clicks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much everyone for all that insight. I mean, you know, it, it's like no problem filling 90 minutes, could have gone on, it's such an important topic. Um, so thank you all again for joining us. Thanks everyone who joined us in the audience and we will see you next time. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.